Right, next up, the first presentation of the conference. Could I please welcome Neil to come and talk to us about reimagining higher education in a digital age? Thank you. Thank you, Neil Morris. Okay, well, um, hello and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And as a regular conference attendee, um, this looks like the most fun conference I've ever seen in my life. Uh, so congratulations to the organisers um, and to everybody who's been involved in supporting me. It's been um, very, very efficient, um, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm really pleased to see the theme of your conference being about people, because as an academic leader, and when I stand in corridors talking to academic and professional services colleagues, there is a real tension, which I'm sure you all feel, between academics and services. And we have a responsibility to break down those barriers between services and remember that this is just about people. And literally, as I was just sat uh, waiting to come up on the stage, a senior academic colleague of mine at a Russell Group University just posted on Facebook saying, IT support, I am sick to death of you. And I just thought, my God, that's so timely, but also so sad that somebody would take to Facebook to express their frustration with effectively your community. And it really brought home to me the fact that we've got a lot of work to do, all of us, to understand the challenges that each of us have in our day-to-day -day lives and the kinds of benefits that we're all trying to bring to the university. And Drew's words about the challenges that the sector face just bring me out in a cold sweat because they're all I ever hear at the University of Leeds from the senior management team. And those pressures apply to all of us in any kind of role at universities. So for this presentation, um, my plan was to, I guess, take a step away from your core agenda of your uh, conference and just give you an insight into my life and the way that digital technology is shaping universities from our perspective and particularly from a student's perspective, the way that they think about higher education and the way that they're likely to want to engage with higher education in the future. And also to reflect on my experiences of projects that I've led. So over the last five years at the University of Leeds, I've led a number of very large scale institutional projects that have all involved the IT service in one way or another alongside a whole range of other professional services. And I want to try and reflect on some of the experiences of the people and the behaviours and the languages that are used um, between services and between academic colleagues. So if none of that's useful, uh, I suggest that you turn over to Twitter uh, because there's the HEA conference going on today which has been wild on Twitter. So if, you're, if I'm boring, I'd have a review through that. So why is digital technology such a big thing in universities <coughs> at the moment? Well, apart from the fact that our own students uh, are now starting to come to university open days having been born in the year 2000, which should be a wake-up call for those of you that hadn't realised it, uh, globally, digital technology and digital learning is huge and set to grow and is shifting seismically the way that universities are thinking about higher education. We are starting to think thankfully, about a broader set of people wanting to engage in higher education. The days of the 18 to 21-year-old being our kind of sole market of campus-based undergraduates are gone, in my view, and we are all aware that we need different kinds of cohorts. Um, we should be looking beyond undergraduate and postgraduate into CPD, into apprenticeships, into vocational education, and all of that will involve digital technology. And 
Thankfully, I work at a university where that is recognised and that we have support from the Vice-Chancellor to invest in that and to think about the ways in which we can offer a broader set of education to a broader set of individuals. I'm an academic. Um, I started life as a neuroscientist and have moved into education alongside my senior management role. And for me, this is all about people. It's all about people learning. It's all about people wanting to be in a community of like-minded individuals and be supported in their learning by their peers and by educators. This is not about technology at all. It's about how people get together to think, to learn, to grow, to gain knowledge. But having said that, there's no doubt that digital technology can support and augment individuals' learning. There's a huge and growing rigorous literature base that demonstrates that digital technology can support individuals' learning in a whole variety of different ways, which I haven't got you know, time to go into any of the detail. But throughout all of my presentations, um, you will always hear me talking about the value of digital technology to support individuals to be more flexible, to be able to access digital technology in a variety of different ways, by changing the mode of access, by changing the pace at which they study, and by changing the place of learning, often flipping between different modes of study <coughs> through their higher education journey. And only digital technology can support this. It was not possible five to ten years ago for an individual to gain credit from Harvard University, from Shanghai University, and from Leeds University simultaneously. It is today possible to do that. And I get ap job applications from people who want to come and work in our research labs who have CVs composed of credit accumulated from world-leading universities simultaneously. This is not a theoretical proposition anymore. People are bringing, making the best use of digital technology to enhance their individual CVs. And it's a theme of my presentation that higher education is becoming unbundled, that people are wanting to access elements of higher education in different ways. And we have a massive challenge to be able to meet the needs of those kinds of learners. And most of our universities are today unable to meet that challenge. So my role at Leeds is to try to support the university to make the very best of the technology landscape that we have that can support our learners, however they are learning with us, be they MOOC learners on a FutureLearn platform who are just um, general interest learners, PhD students who are studying by distance, or an 18-year-old undergraduate who's entirely on campus. And we've had a strategy. We've got a digital strategy. I don't want to spend time talking about strategy. I want to focus on the people behind that strategy. And this piece of work I would recommend to you is a piece of work that I've recently completed with a colleague at Leeds, which was commissioned by the Leadership Foundation for Higher Education. They asked us to look at... Um, the ways in the factors that we thought were important for successful change in technology enhanced learning projects. And we came out, one of the outputs of the project was an interactive checklist that is available freely on their website that works through these nine areas. And this draws very heavily on my experience of leading large institutional projects that involve IT to deliver institutional um, technology enhancements. And again, I don't have the time to go through this in detail, but the middle line, I think, is really important for the theme of your conference. It's about the people that are involved in change. So we, as leads, I'm sure many of you, have very large student populations. We don't work with them enough. We don't 
talk to them about their needs. We don't involve them in projects. We don't involve them in change. We don't seek their feedback in ways which they are interested in giving feedback, and I don't mean sending out surveys. And we don't use the real intelligence and creativity that our student populations have to really help us to do things effectively. So I would encourage you just to take that away and think about how you as a community can work more effectively with students. And on the other side, I would suggest that the role of academic champions is hugely underutilised in many universities. At Leeds, we have academic champions for digital learning who report to me, and they're embedded within all of the faculties across the university. And they're a fantastic resource for me to find out what priorities there are within faculties, but also to draw on their time and expertise to make change happen. And they can help us in projects by sitting in the room and really articulating what it feels like to be an academic end user of a project which is being delivered across the university. And there are very many, very willing academic colleagues around your universities who are, will be happy to share their experiences and their insights. They can come across as being critical challenge, and we need to stop thinking them as critical challenge that we don't want to listen to. We need to get into the mindset of hearing them as individuals who are dealing with difficult situations in front of hundreds of people day in, day out. So when they say, yes, I'm happy to be recorded using lecture capture, but I have these concerns, they're real concerns. They don't want to be embarrassed in front of 300 students who look up to them when the technology doesn't work. And they don't want to have to spend 10 minutes of their 50-minute session waiting for the PC to load and to log in and then to have to do 10 different things before they start talking to students. And these can come across, if presented badly to you, as, it doesn't work, I'm fed up with IT, get over here and fix it. And I've heard that said by academics to people who probably work for you at IT service desks. All they're doing is expressing their embarrassment and frustration that they're currently stood in front of 300 students who look up to them. And if we just remembered that, it would help everybody's rela um, relationships. And the final thing that I think I would draw out of this slide is the fact that we as a community do not use evidence well when we're trying to deliver change. We have a huge amount of pilot studies of learning that's happened at other universities, and yet when we start our own projects, we start with a blank sheet of paper, we come up with it all ourselves, and we think that our way is the only way it can possibly work. And we really fail to draw on the experiences of others when planning and implementing projects at every stage. So I would encourage you when you're working with stakeholders around your organisations to get them, if it's not you, to bring forward the evidence, to bring forward the literature and to translate that literature into language that everybody around the table can understand so that you can go through this change feeling that the change has got an evidence base to it. And when you do that, you will find that the academic community are much more in line and on board with your change. It's really important to remember that you know, academics have been bred to be critical, to be challenging. Their PhD studies, all of their marking, all of their interactions with journal editors and grant reviewers is about criticism, about challenge, and about hierarchy of who knows more about what. And they bring that with them to every meeting that you have with them. They want to know the evidence. They want to know that it's been done rigorously, that you can back up your plan. And that's all they're doing. That's just because that's what they do when they talk to PhD students and their colleagues. And they don't know how to be different in different situations. And that's a criticism of them and me as an academic. But if we all just think this is the way they're bringing it and think of them as critical friends, it might change um, the relationship. 
The other piece that I would bring to this before I show you a few examples of the work that we've been done doing is some of this evidence. And I don't expect you know, to take this away and think, have this on your wall and use it when you talk to people. But this is the most highly respected theory around w why people accept and use technology. And I've had three or four PhD students who've used this model in a whole range of different scenarios. And it works. It really does work. And it's very useful just to think about what are people thinking when they're intending to engage with a changed environment as it relates to technology. And basically it comes down to the perceived usefulness of this technology and the perceived ease of use of this technology. And those are the kind of two central things that people around the world, in any sector, in any technology implementation, will be asking themselves. If I think this is going to be useful, and I think it's going to be easy to use, I'm more likely to change my behaviour. Now, there's a whole range of other factors that will influence those two things, including age. But those are the two central tenets. So if you can construct a story that says, this change is going to be useful, and it's going to be easier than what you do now, possibly in the long term, you'll already be tapping into something that is evidence-based and that will work for them. They will listen. So I would encourage you to Google this. Uh, it's, in, it's been interpreted in many different ways in many different sectors. Uh, it's presented in many much more straightforward ways than I've probably said it. Um, but I would encourage you just to think about it with your teams and think, how can we change our language when we're talking to people about things that are likely to hook them into this change? And we've used this theory in all of the projects that I've been involved with at Leeds to help people to come around to change and to think about um, the technology in different ways. So, then we get into some, uh, some real stuff. So these are the main projects that I've been involved with at Leeds in the last five years um, of my role. And they have all involved all staff and all students. That's my remit. I don't do things that are for the School of Medicine's 800 students or the business school's 2,000. I only do projects that are for everybody across the institution. And so that means that we're basically doing change management all of the time. We're trying to build the case with the academic community and with the student community that what we're going to implement is going to be better, is going to be something that they will find useful. It might be a bit bumpy as we implement it, but in the longer term, it's going to be a better working environment and it will support their needs. And remember that all of those people are thinking about learning. So all of these things are to help them with their learning. So I'll just, uh, I'm going to skip through some stuff, but I just want to share with you a few of these stories. So most people will know Leeds and digital technology through its project and partnership with media site um, Sonic Foundry to implement institution-wide lecture capture and multimedia management. And we did this um, three years ago. It was launched three years ago um, in September. And we went from zero capability to institutional capability overnight. We didn't do a phased rollout. We didn't do any kind of phased deployment. We put the capability on every single computer work used by staff and students and in every single central teaching space and turned it on on the 9th of September. Now, many people cautioned me against this approach. This was a very, very large and complicated project. 
It involved our facilities directorate having to equip 250 rooms with kit. It involved the IT service having to scale up to be able to take 300 hours of recording into transcoding and servers every day. And it required our whole academic community to engage with the fact that we were suddenly going to start recording because we're in an opt-out policy environment, which means we record unless you opt out, which means we record 75% of stuff. And quite rightly, many people said to me, this will fail because you're trying to do too much at once, Neil. And my response was, if we don't do it all at once, it won't be a consistent experience for the learners and for the staff. Because if we put it into 50 rooms and on 100 machines, then the students will only get the experience a tenth of the time, a twentieth of the time. We have to have this everywhere so that everybody can benefit from it immediately. Because for students, the consistency of experience and for staff is incredibly important. They want to know that if we're lecture capturing, we're lecture capturing everything. Not the ones where you happen to be in a fancy room where there's a camera, but everything. And because this is really important to students, they now rely on it. One and a half million views a year, and God help you if you haven't recorded your lectures at Leeds because the students will slay you. They have become reliant on this as a means of support for their learning. And the 3,000 academics had to go through a very dramatic change process to engage with a completely new way of teaching and a new way of being recorded. And it was difficult. It was very, very difficult. But those nine factors that I showed you earlier got us through it. We got through it together as a community and we worked on the challenges and we talked a lot with everybody about why this was challenging. It's very emotive. People are worried about being recorded. People are genuinely scared of students posting videos on YouTube where they've been parodied to some rap song, and God only, if someone would do that, it would be fantastic. <laughs> they never have. But people are really anxious about this. And so that's why the theme of your conference is so important, because if you keep thinking about the people behind all of these bits of kit and these changes, it will all get a lot easier. Now, the thing with this project was, strategically, what we're trying to do is stop people lecturing. Because talking to students for 50 minutes is quite poor pedagogically. And I was at Cardiff University yesterday at their annual learning and teaching conference. And I said this, and in a breakout session about three hours later, a lecturer in physics who didn't know I was sat in the room said, I don't agree with Neil Morris that 50-minute lectures are not valuable. It's very important that I stand here and tell the students what they need to know for 50 minutes. And it just made me think, we still don't get this. We still, as people, are thinking that it's my job as an academic to convey knowledge to you as recipients and that I'm the only person who can tell you stuff. We've not got the fact that this can be better by doing it differently. But we'll keep going. And one of the things that the Lecture Capture Project has taught us at Leeds is that now our challenge is space. Because the configuration of our space doesn't support the ways in which students want to learn and actually most teachers want to teach. Because rows of seats on concrete are very inconvenient if you want to say, I've recorded the introduction, and in the session we're actually going to talk about it. Rows of seats where you can't talk to each other are very difficult. <coughs> and so now the challenge that we have is to convert these kinds of spaces 
which I'm sure are very recognisable to you, into things like this, where students can work together, can collaborate, can ask each other questions, and God forbid the teacher can actually go and talk to a group of students in the room. They can actually go and stand next to them instead of being on this pedestal behind this lump. And so the challenge that we have is to create rooms like this out of our traditional lecture theatres. And the innovation for me is to bring in digital technology into that space to enhance that collaboration and that conversation. So we've just created a series of rooms at Leeds where we've done exactly that. We have collaborative group-based working areas which are equipped with digital technology <coughs> which is connected both to each other and to the front of the room so that students can share work with the teacher, the teacher can give them work to do, they can access the VLE, they can, God forbid, go and do some work on Facebook as a group and they can share and save their work and they can collaborate. And these kind of rooms are what we need to have on our campuses. Many, many more of them. Now the technical challenge behind a room like this is enormous because we've now got 30 odd laptops in every lecture theatre that need to be supported. We've got the most sophisticated media site installation in these rooms where we've got dual projection and digital smart boards at the front that are all being captured and multiple video streams. And that's exciting. That's the kind of background technology that we should have in these rooms. But for this woman standing up, she doesn't care about any of that. She cares about how to make this learning environment work for her in the 50 minutes that she's got with those students. With all of this fancy dashboard that she's got to navigate, how is she going to help the students to learn in that time? So go back to you taught, go back to perceived ease of use. The technology has to be really simple. It's a really nice touch screen that tells the academic what they need to do to perform certain tasks, to bring up the, white, the screens from table number seven, to change between whiteboard and um, laptops, etc., etc. So these rooms are being successful because the technology is in the background and the training is there to support the staff and the room is easy to use and it works. And they're really, really fantastic. We're uh, in the middle of evaluation and the students are very happy um, with the rooms. So my last example is a different example and I think this will probably be interesting to many of you. Attendance monitoring is a really thorny issue at universities. We have to do it. And we know that it is very expensive in time and resource to collect students' attendance. And we mainly do it by paper. So we've made the decision at Leeds that we need to make this a background technology process that doesn't interfere with academics who don't want anything to do with it and with students who really don't like it either but mainly get frustrated by the fact that there's bits of paper passing around four versions of registers every class. So we've decided to go for a check-in system which is using Bluetooth beacons. Um, it's from the Campus M Ex Libris portfolio and it's building on um, an app that we have which we call UniLees, which is the Campus M um, app. The reason this project will be successful is that this app is in the hands of all of our students. And it's in their hands because it has their personalised timetable on it. And they want that. So they all have it on their phones. And they use it all of the time. And that was the main reason that we decided to use this app for attendance monitoring. Because 
They don't care about attendance monitoring, and there is no way we would get 30,000 students to download an app that said attendance monitoring. But if we put it into an app that they want and they need and they use, then it's already there, and they will tolerate the fact that the app is doing attendance monitoring as well. And so we've exploited the dual functionality of a system that the users want to do a function that we need. And I really don't like this project. I, as an academic, do not like the idea of attendance monitoring. But the reason I'm leading it is because what we can do off the back of this project is to integrate polling, surveys, and location-based activities. And those are things that will really enhance the student <coughs> experience and will support academics. And they will help me to have s consistency, seamless experience, and removing all of the other quiz tool apps that are proliferating across the university campus. So I am prepared to take the pain of this project for the end goal, which will be a simple, single, easy-to-use solution for quizzing, polling, and surveys for our students. And in the background, attendance monitoring will just happen. Okay, I'll leave it there, because I know um, we want to leave some time for questions, so thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Neil? That was an excellent presentation. Any questions? Sally? We have now. I was just going to ask about um, the how are you supporting the laptops in the classroom um, and kind of how that, that relationship between the academics and the um, support staff's working? Um, yeah, so support for in-class um, kit is with facilities directorate, um, with back-end kind of IT support for updates and stuff as it is with all of our central teaching space. Um, and the relationship seems to be working very well because we have a service designed for these rooms like we do for everything else, so everybody knows whose responsibility it is to sort problems out, which is something that I learnt leading projects very early on, that don't let a project go live until you have a service definition document of who's going to do what when it goes wrong. Um, so it means that the academics know where to go for problems, and that, for them, is really important because they don't care that there's an IT service and a facilities directorate and a da -de da service and a da -de da service. They just want someone to solve the problem. And it's our responsibility in the background to make the connections for them. Does that answer your question? Um, I don't need a much further thing. <laughs> so when you decided you were going to do this project, how did you work out how many people you'd need to be looking at? Each Which one? Project? Sorry. The whole uh, media cap. The lecture capture. Um, well, actually, we, we only have two people supporting lecture capture at Leeds um, because we have such a great relationship with Sonic Foundry and they provide us with a very good support because, because it's such a huge installation um, and the model that we have with them is that they are supporting us through upgrades and supporting the kit. But So we have two people in the IT service who run media site, but then of course we have facilities directorate who are running the kit in the rooms, but that's a just additional effort for them to you know, add a media site box onto the list of things they have to look after. So I can't give you an exact number, um, but in IT it's two people. Do we have any more questions? Yep, one here. Uh, no, so they're supporting the application. Okay. So the server team will support the servers. So Sally can probably answer this better than I can, being ex lead. So you're going to ask me technical questions, I don't know. No, it's not really a technical question, it's more a political question. Yeah. Again. So if um, one of your academics was looking at the laptop, yeah. would they be able to 
Yeah. Yep. Right. How is that issue solved? So they would go to our, our service desk um, immediately and then it would just get routed to in-room support, server support, application support. Does that help? I'll just add to that as well, because I was actually involved really um, heavily so well, in that project. That's why I was hoping she would. <laughs> but um, we did actually put additional resource in the service desk um, to enable us to, to kind of support lecture capture. And the service desk were involved really closely um, within the project. They got to be, you know, they got to demo it and they got to go on training and stuff. So they could answer some of the um, initial kind of um, questions at, at kind of the service desk. But also that service definition model they knew where to route things, so they knew how to route things to the infrastructure team if it looked like an infrastructure issue, or they were able to route it to the um, application support or the VLE team, for example. So I think that was a really good example of actually where IT support and, and the project did um, engage really, really well. Yeah, it, it was bumpy, but um, we, we got there. <laughs> bumpy is part of the process. It's part of the fun. It's not bumpy, you haven't been challenging enough with your scope. Okay, can we invite you all to join me in thanking Neil again for that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.